see such a large crowd here. It's a testimony to, I think, the interest in our speaker today, Minister Joe McHugh. Um, this is the uh, part of the series uh, sponsored by Irish Aid called Development Matters. It's a series that has been going on for the last number of years. It's a really important part of our programme every year where we bring top quality speakers about development issues and, if you like, expose their views to the public and expose our views to those speakers. So that's, that's part of it. Um, so I, I particularly want on this occasion to acknowledge the contribution that Michael Gaffey has made, uh, the current Director General of Irish Aid, who will be moving on to be Ambassador to the Irish uh, in, in Geneva, uh, the Irish uh, Permanent Representation in Geneva. Just also to acknowledge a, a, a couple of other people who are here. Nora, obviously, is a really important part of our, our membership of our development group here. But uh, Peter Power, who was uh, currently a former aid minister uh, and uh, is now head of UNICEF, and a particular welcome to Barry Andrews, who will be taking over this seat uh, as of next Monday. Uh, and Barry has, again, a distinguished uh, record as uh, both Minister for Children and he also was CEO of Go. So, with that by way of background, Joe McHugh was appointed Minister of State for the Diaspora and International Development in May 2016. So he's had a very active year in learning about these two important portfolio, portfolios. Um, he was Minister for State with special responsibility for Gale Tucked Affairs and Natural Resources from 2014 to 2016, and we all know we all know how, in the course of that, he mastered the Irish language. So, congratulations on that. He previously held the position of chairperson of the Joint Directors Committee on the Implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. He served as co-chair of the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly. He was first elected to the Dáil in the 2007 general election, having served in Shannon Aaron for five years as Fine Gael spokesperson on community, rural Gaeltacht and marine affairs. It's a great pleasure to welcome you, Minister, and we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's an absolute pleasure being here, and uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge in the first instance a couple of former colleagues, uh, and Peter and Barry. Uh, I didn't have the pleasure, Nora, of sitting in the Dáil alongside you, but... Uh, we did have an opportunity of meeting in 2008 in Denver, Colorado, at a certain convention, uh, and uh, it's great, great to see you again. Um, and you mentioned the Good Friday Agreement Committee there, Tom. I, I will acknowledge somebody. I see Peter Glennon here representing the U.S. Embassy. Uh, I just want to acknowledge all the work that you did uh, and your colleagues did during my tenure and the work you continue to do in relation to that. Um, Tom, you're moving on. Uh, you said downstairs you're, you're going to be kept busy when you do move on, but I just want to acknowledge uh, your, your contribution and the role that you have played, uh, and no doubt your work will continue uh, under the capable hands of Barry uh, into the future as well. And I suppose today is a significant day. Um, somebody has got their, the letter that Theresa May has sent uh, on their iPhone somewhere. I haven't seen it yet, but obviously... Uh, Article 50 has been triggered, and I know that will bring its own challenges in relation to the um, future um, contribution, future collaboration. Uh, but one thing I would say on it is I met with the British Ambassador a couple of months ago, and, and I certainly, in my capacity as Minister for International Development, will continue um, to have our focus at, at both the European Union level, but also in our uh, connections with the, with the British in relation to collaboration at international aid and I'll be meet, meeting pretty, pretty Patel next week as well to continue those conversations. Um, I, I am pleased uh, that Irish Aid is represented here today. I think Michael Gaffey is somewhere in the building. I don't know if he's in the room. Is he in the building, Rose? He's down the back. Yeah, all the bad boys down the back, Michael. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge Michael and uh, his own uh, leadership with Irish Aid uh, and that, you know, that that period of time that I've been working as Minister for International Development, Michael, you've been uh, both an inspiration and also uh, you've um, helped me give, develop a good insight into the great, great work that's going on at, at an Irish aid level, but also the 
uh, collaboration you have with our partners, uh, NGOs and all the other stakeholders. So I'd like to acknowledge Michael and, and his uh, role that he'll continue to play when you move on to Geneva. That's all public, isn't it, Michael? We can say that, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so just in relation to the Develop Matters series of lectures, I'm glad to be here. Um, I've had a slightly wider, wide canvas uh, in my short time. I, I remember getting the phone call from Andy Kenny to be Minister for Diaspora and International Development, and the first thing I thought was, how do I explain this to my family? Um, because, as you know, diaspora is pretty um, global, uh, as is international development. So it was a bit of a balancing act, uh, the, subs the, the following phone call after the Tisha's phone call to, to my family, uh, to explain how do, we, how do we balance that. But within 48 hours, I was on a plane to Istanbul, to the World Humanitarian Summit, um, and just to, to be present at that summit, uh, along with President Higgins and his leadership, to see his leadership uh, firsthand and his enthusiasm and inspired, uh, his, his inspiration also his motivation in relation to all things humanitarian and development. Uh, it said to me within the first 48 hours of, the, of, of, of my role in the position of international development that not alone have the Irish contributed, not alone do the Irish have a footprint, but the Irish will continue to play a very dominant uh, and lead role in all these enormous challenges that we face with. And we're all aware of pain, loss, conflict. Um, we're all aware of the, the human tragedies uh, internationally and globally. But what it said to me within the first 48 hours of this job was we will continue to play uh, a leading role uh, in relation to our contribution uh, and also to use the word that was used recently at the, the meeting in Limerick with the, with the missions back, uh, back, back at the beginning of January, <coughs> that <coughs> authenticity where there is a trust, where people do trust the Irish in relation to our motivation, uh, in relation to international work. So um, that, uh, that was within the, first, within the first 48 hours. But what I wanted to do was to get a feel for some of the work in, in Africa. Um, I had an enormous privilege in meeting with wonderful women and children from South Sudan in a transfer station in Adjamani on the South Sudanese border. And what that said to me quite clearly, one word, there's still hope. People have hope. People still hope that one day they'll go back to their country. And similarly in, the, similarly in the Zatari camp in Jordan, when I met Syrians a couple of weeks ago, the statistic is 14 out of 15 Syrians want to go home. There is that hope that eventually they, they, they will be back in their home soil. So obviously there's massive challenges internationally at, uh, uh, at, at, at a number of levels in order to make that happen. But it's important to point out that when we are faced with, I suppose, a number of sort of despairing uh, realities internationally. The people themselves, uh, the people, the 65 million people that are displaced, the 21 million people that find themselves in refugee status, or the 10 million uh, children under 18 years of age that are displaced because of, are refugees because of conflict. Um, we still have a duty, and I know the Irish will continue to respond to that. Um, in relation to the figures, uh, David Miliband, Miliband pointed out that sometimes we become uh, numb to these figures, you know, 65 million, it, it's just a figure. Um, and all those individuals uh, and those individual circumstances, um, it's very hard, it's hard, very hard to turn those figures into, into a reality. But I think it's important uh, to emphasize, Irish people get it. Irish people continue to understand that there is a need. And while the photograph on the Greek beach of the young boy um, that was found dead and washed up on the shore was one that created a massive clamor in the media, Irish people up to that point, they, they still understood that we've got a massive uh, challenge here and we have, to, uh, we have to address that challenge. And it's reflected in, in our contribution uh, financially. If you think on the, the, the economic crisis going back to 2011, during that crisis, when there was a lot of um, cutbacks and different budgetary uh, sections, and I mean, I, I was in government at the time, and you, you would have felt the full wrath uh, of, I certainly felt the full wrath of the, my own constituents in Donegal when you were making reductions in different areas from disabilities to carers grants. And still, during that period, 2011 up to 2016, the Irish taxpayer still uh, delivered 4.5 billion in overseas aid. That 
there was never a single reduction in that amount. That doesn't still um, satisfy the ambition to go to 0.7. We're still a long way off the 0.7, but obviously that 4.5 billion over that period of time is, is significant and it says a whole lot about the Irish people and the Irish people's investment in trying to do uh, the right thing internationally. Since the uh, summit in Istanbul, I have been wrestling with the question of where the balance lies between crises and challenges, between progress and failure. In other words, is there a strong shared purpose in addressing the world's problems? Or is there instead a free and consensus on how to tackle these issues, or worse still, a growing disagreement on whether to tackle these issues? The first issue I'd like to address is the humanitarian challenge. We are facing an unprecedented humanitarian situation globally. Um, the work that Irish Aid does in its collaboration is uh, there is an inextricable link between humanitarian and development. And I think maybe what we need to do as a country, I think we have to reflect over our last 40, 50 years. And if you think on where we've come as a country in terms of uh, empowerment of women, uh, education as a, as a vehicle towards uh, better lifestyles, uh, for a, an enormous number of families in this country. And that was over a short period of time, 40, 40, 45 years. So if you think on where we've come in, we have to remain very focused that we can still contribute and use our experience and use that template as a possibility for uh, other countries that are struggling. And, you know, I was speaking to Eamon there, Eamon Meehan, in, in, in the work that they're doing, the Trocra, for example, are doing in Beirut, and I got to see a number of... Uh, uh, Syrian families, a number of uh, uh, Palestinians, you're, you're still working on that empowerment uh, model of trying to develop the people themselves in their respective countries. The same was happening in Karamoja in Uganda with uh, Concern, where they were very focused on empowering and creating leaders and developing le leaderships at a community level. And we have to take that model, because if we continue to, you know, I suppose if we, if we continue to look at humanitarian and develop money as, uh, as contributions, um, if we still look at it as if we're, as, as it, as, is it a way of facilitating short-term problems or are we looking at the long-term? But I would like to acknowledge all the groups uh, and even to come back to the Zadhari camp in, in Jordan, to see all the agencies, uh, to see two hospitals in a five, 0.3 kilometer square environment with 80,000 Syrian people in a camp in Zatari, two hospitals, uh, a number of schools, and to see Syrian teachers teaching Syrian children, that certainly gives, gives me hope. The scale of the crisis compels us to ask fundamental questions. While we are addressing it, have we failed in tackling the main drivers of these crises? Intractable conflict, vulnerability of certain populations, climate change, generational po poverty. How do we make the difficult choices between providing ever-increasing assistance to people caught in huma humanitarian emergencies or sustaining our development programmes in order to have longer-term impact? And I know there are concerns in relation to Brexit. There are concerns in relation to the new administration in the United States in terms of commitment. So I am aware and I am conscious of all these challenges. Um, but we still have to have hope um, as a base, as a cornerstone of our work. Um, to hear from the Syrian people uh, gives me hope. And I think what we have to do, we also have to do, we have a massive role to play in this country. We have to re reflect the, the, the incredible generosity of spirit in this country. Uh, I'm going to be parochial and using an example in Nishon, an event recently, uh, Patsy Toland, Changemakers Project, where there's been an open-hearted, open-door welcome to Syrian families in Carandona. Are we doing enough to highlight that? Are we doing enough to highlight the fact that there, there, there are uh, people very, very willing and very happy to take in people, obviously in a, in a mani managed way. So I think we need to, we need to look at ways of, of, of highlighting the good stuff. And I know the SDGs are a big part of it. Peter, you mentioned it downstairs. And we, will, we are getting closer to the, the implementation stage. But I think we don't have to convince anybody in Ireland about doing the right thing because of our uh, connections internationally, because of our footprint, because of our missionary work, because of all the great work done down the decades from priests and nuns internationally. We have a footprint and we have an understanding and we have to, we have to articulate that uh, a wee bit more and a wee bit better. Up the road, Port Marnock Secondary School, crowd of secondary schools, 
children, not children, teenagers. Uh, they're developing apps for the, lo the local authority in Lesotho. So they're working with local government in Lesotho and developing apps, digital mapping for that country through a secondary school. So it's about being smart, it's about being clever, and uh, it's about, I suppose, my job as a politician to articulate those. I am extremely concerned about the worsening humanitarian situations in the northeast of Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan and Yemen. Famine has been declared in parts of South Sudan in recent weeks and the UN is calling for urgent action to avoid famine in Nigeria, Somalia and Yemen. And uh, myself and Michael started the conversation around a possible visit to South Sudan. Uh, I'm very, very keen to do that and I'm very, very open uh, to working with our different partners and making that uh, programme number one a reality but also most importantly uh, a fruitful journey as well in terms of what we can do. Other crises understand, understandably grab headlines in the focus of the international community, others tend to be forgotten and underfunded. A key priority of Ireland's humanitarian assistance has been to pay this special attention to the forgotten and underfunded crisis. Since 2012, Ireland has, paid, has, has provided more than 100 million in humanitarian assistance to the Horn of Africa region alone, uh, provided almost 6 million in humanitarian assistance to Yemen since the conflict began in 2015, and we intend to, to, to maintain similar, similar levels of support in 2017. But can I just say in relation to, to, to use Jordan as an example, and also Uganda, um, I think we need to do more to acknowledge um, and the, the great role that's been played by these individual governments, the people in Jordan, the citizens in Uganda, for the pressure that they're, they're coming under enormous pressure. Uh, for example, when I was in Uganda, there were half a million people, or there were half a million refugees in Uganda last July. That figure now has grown to 750,000 in a very, very short period of time. So it goes back to the root cause, the, the underlying, under, on, the underlying uh, I suppose reasons for conflict, uh, but a lot of these countries are coming under pressure. Jordan has 25% uh, of their population, total population, under refugee status, and the land is finite, um, as these countries are finding out, and we need to be very conscious of that. But what we have to do at every stage, at every level, is to acknowledge the work that they that they are they are doing. Um, the UN Security Council, I want to mention is one of the many reasons we are seeking election to the UN uh, Security Council is because of our, the opportunity we have to focus not only on global humanitarian needs but also on the peaceful resolution of the violence that is fueling uh, humanitarian crisis. Supporting the peaceful resolution of conflict is a cardinal foreign policy priority for Ireland. Our approach encompasses conflict prevention, resolution, mediation and peace building efforts. We have our own story to tell. We're a country that has come from conflict to peace. Uh, peace is never uh, an end game, it's a process uh, and we have to continue and continue to work hard at it, our own peace process in Northern Ireland. It's still a fragile process but it's something that we can point to internationally that has been uh, a positive. We have engaged in lessons sharing, sharing from Northern Ireland in the context of conflicts and peace process in Colombia, Ukraine, Turkey and the Middle East. And I want to acknowledge our Irish uh, Defence Forces as well. Uh, I had a great uh, privilege of meeting the Defence Forces in South Lebanon a number of weeks ago. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge their approach now in the new recruitment drive to have more women uh, on their, uh, as, as part of the Defence Forces because there are cultural challenges in uh, different countries and I think that's a good thing and I would like to acknowledge their, their work in that, in that regard. Um, it is clear that we must do more and do better. I mentioned the World Humanitarian earlier, Summit earlier where UN member states all made commitments to go further and uh, we, we certainly won't be found wanting in that. The impetus from the summit was looked to initiatives such as a grand bargain must be sustained and as donors we must continue to work together to maximise the resources available and the effect effectiveness of our action in order to meet those urgent needs. I'm, I'm really, really appreciative uh, of, of being here, being invited. Um, I certainly want to hear from you as to what we can be doing better because there is no... There is no magic formula here. Um, we have an enormous crisis, but I just go back to my initial point, and I said it in the Shannon today, Ireland has such a role to play in, in maintaining that leadership role. And when I think back to President Higgins, when he made a contribution in Istanbul, female African leaders stood up and gave him a standing ovation. 
and that wasn't uh, just because he was saying nice things. Um, he was saying very, very challenging things. But they're looking. A lot of countries are looking to Ireland to continue in that leadership role, and uh, I certainly would like to play my bit as well. So, Gurumila Magnus.